Welcome. I'm Jeff Resnick. I'm Chief of the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for joining us today for uh, today's NLM History Talk. And for those of you on Twitter, thanks for following along using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. NLM History Talks are designed to promote awareness and use of NLM historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the National Library of Medicine to recognize the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe. Moreover, the series aims to appreciate the diversity of individuals of various disciplines who value these collections and related others to advance their research, teaching, and their learning. Before I introduce today's speakers, I just want to offer a reminder about our next talk, which will be our last of our 2021 series. Join us on Thursday, October 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, when we'll welcome Dr. Farron Yarrow, postdoctoral associate at Duke University in Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. She's a historian of science and medicine in Latin America and the Caribbean. Dr. Yarrow will be speaking on a family drama, The Sexual Politics of Smallpox Vaccination in the Spanish Empire. Today, I have the privilege of introducing two speakers representing two great institutions and their world-renowned collections of moving images. Angela Sayward is a research development specialist at Welcome Collection, a free museum and library located in central London that aims to challenge how we th all think of and feel about health. Through exhibitions and collections, live programming, digital broadcast, and publishing, Welcome creates opportunities for people to think deeply about the connections between science, medicine, life, and art. Welcome Collection is part of the Welcome Trust, which was established under, the, under Sir Henry Welcome's will in 1936. Angela Sayward holds an internationally recognized background in film and sound archives and a master's degree in media technology administration from London's University of the Arts. She has worked with artists and publishers and television producers on various archive film projects, and she's written widely on her stewardship of moving images held by Welcome Collection. And she's also spoken at numerous conferences with colleagues around the world, including her co-presenter today, Sarah Eilers. Sarah Eilers oversees the audiovisuals collection at the National Library of Medicine, the world's largest biomedical library, located on the campus of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. With her own internationally recognized uh, uh, background in film studies and curation, as well as master's degrees in government from the University of Texas at Austin and in library science from the University of Maryland, Sarah has written and spoken extensively about the NLM's collection of over 10,000 health, medical, and scientific film uh, titles in film, tape, and other formats. She is NLM's subject matter expert in historical film, regularly fielding research inquiries, building research collaborations around the collection, and raising awareness of it among individuals around the world. And notably, Sarah is director of Medicine on Screen, NLM's curated portal featuring films from the NLM's collection, including productions that they will discuss today, which you will all see. You'll find Medicine On Screen at medicineonscreen.nlm.nih.gov. After today's talk, please take a moment to learn more about Angela and Sarah's work and the collections they oversee uh, through our interview with them on our blog, uh, Circulating Now. You'll find it as the featured post at circulatingnow.nlm.nih.gov. Additionally, if you have questions as you listen to today's presentation, please send them along using the live feedback button located at the bottom of the video screen or if you're following along on Twitter using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. We'll address these as we can during our Q&A following the presentation. And by the way, if you don't see the live feedback bu button, just reload the page of your browser and it will appear. So Angela and Sarah join us today to discuss a subject in film with immediate historical and contemporary relevance, indeed resonance, as well as the very medium of moving images for conveying environmental messages about individual, community, and global health and well-being. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome both of them speaking on peril in the air, pollution, activism, and film. So over to both of you, and with thanks for presenting today. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Eilers. Angela and I have collaborated before on panels and research, and we are very happy to be doing so again. One thing she and I talked about as we planned this presentation is that we're in the fortunate position of discussing with our audience and with each other a topic on which a considerable amount of recent scholarship has been done. 
I'm going to give you a quick overview of that. And this is material you can explore further if you'd like. Then Angela will take you back to the earliest days of peril in the air and the use of film to communicate. And then back to me again for a closer look at pollution on film in the US, um, especially in the context of films produced by the federal government and government advocacy, how the films were disseminated and how um, films on this topic evolved as the 1960s gave way to the 1970s. Next slide. Since we're streaming material, you may find the sound or image to be glitchy along the way. So there, here are the URLs for the, uh, each of the films we're showing clips from. And any of them can be found in NLM digital collections by limiting to moving image and putting in a few words of the title as well. Next slide. Here at NLM, it started with our exhibitions program led by Patty Chewy. A couple of years ago, that team began to explore a 1970 exhibit that NLM had developed and hosted called The Darkening Day. The Darkening Day examined all manner of environmental threats from fossil fuels, um, open burning of trash to filthy rivers, fish kills, and the perils of nuclear energy. NLM planned a new exhibit for September 2020 called 50 Years Ago to take a look back at that 1970 effort, including the work of Rachel Carson in founding the modern environmental movement. COVID-19 interfered with our plans to stage a physical exhibit, but we do have a wonderful online presentation, as you can see at this URL. Next slide. These are images from the original 1970 exhibit, which featured material contributed by entities as divergent as the Sierra Club and the DuPont Corporation. Film was not part of the original Darkening Day, but the exhibitions program invited me to add moving images to 50 years ago. And in educating myself on that topic and selecting film titles from our collection to include in the 2020 commemoration, the leadership and role of the federal government in working to combat pollution really stood out to me as did its aspirational use of film as a means of achieving that. You see this arch, the St. Louis arch, that's gonna come around again in a clip and the use and reuse of these um, so-called guilty chimneys images is a theme and a practice in these films. Next slide. A little more about the scholarship. We decided we'd highlight the topic of film in the environment in Medicine on Screen, which as Jeff described, is our curated portal to the NLM Historical Audiovisuals Collections. It's a site that showcases films by pairing them with essays that take a deep dive into one or more titles at a time. And in this case, Dr. Jennifer Peterson of, the, of Woodbury University in Los Angeles wrote about six films from the NLM collection. At the same time, Angela, had been working on an article that has now been published called Just Breathe and exploring a film called It Takes Your Breath Away, which you'll hear more about um, in just a few moments. A large audience got a sneak preview of Jennifer's and Angela's um, work at the May 2020 Orphan Film Symposium, whose themes you see here on the right. Angela followed up her talk at Orphans with her own medicine on screen essay, Air Pollution as a Human Problem, which you see over on the left. And Jennifer Peterson finally was a guest in January 2021 on a podcast called Framing Media. It was episode number eight and discussing these six films that Jennifer writes about in Medicine on Screen. So now we're going to shift over to Angela, who will take you back to the earliest days of the UK's peril in the air. Next slide. Thank you for joining me for this talk and to my co-presenter, Sarah Eilers. I've worked with Sarah and the National Library of Medicine audiovisuals for some time now, and we found lots of interesting points of comparison in our mutual collections. Our joint presentation is designed to consider the global effects of air pollution, especially in cities where many of us live, and remind us that activism didn't start recently or in one location. It's been ongoing. Next slide, please. I've been working with our AV collections since 2005, looking at ways to make them more accessible. Here is a peek at some of the shelves in our store loaded with films and videos. 
with about 10,000 items in total from a wax cylinder audio recording of an address by Florence Nightingale in support of the veterans of the Battle of Balaclava in 1892, to born digital video files recorded, recording lived experiences of health today. Working with AV materials has many challenges. The first is around formats and playability. We hold about 3,000 films on eight, nine and a half, 16 and 35 millimeter gauges. And our preservation strategy is to digitize all this material for the future. And then there are at least 16 video formats as well as many more audio formats, such as the wax cylinder I mentioned before. Next slide, please. Before we consider the films, I wanted to take you on a journey back in time to explore how pollution activism has been framed historically. The title of the talk, Peril in the Air, was inspired by the front page of the 12 page booklet advertising PEPS tablets for coughs and colds from the UK in the left of the slide. It sensationalizes the potential threat from hidden microbes, germs and viruses, which are ambient in the air. It was made in 1913, just before the advent of the First World War in Europe in 1914, hence Zeppelin warships looming on the horizon and the panicking crowds below. It has combined the actual threat of germs with the existential threat of invasion. In the pages of the booklet, I lit upon the following sentence. A bad smoky fog causes more deaths than a modern battle. So the evidence that foul air from pollution causes ill health was already understood. Our relationship between disease and here pollution is frequently characterized as a battle or fight and in films as well as other media types, on many occasions we encounter the language of war being used. Whether this booklet was a successful advertising tool in promoting sales of pets is hard to say, but it vividly reflects the zeitgeist of the time. Next slide, please. Even further back in 1661, John Evelyn published a work, Fumi Fugian, the digitized title page is shown here on the left about the foul smoke which hung over parts of London. The timing of this work was to mark the reign of Charles II, who had ascended to the throne when the monarchy was restored in 1660. The work was aimed at moving noxious trades to the outskirts of the city so that the centre was a more pleasant place to be, with space for gardens and pleasure, what we now understand to be zoning. Evelyn was a meticulous diarist and a gardener. He was also keen to gain favour with the new king. He may have been surprised, therefore, that hundreds of years later, he had become identified as the grandfather of pollution activism in the UK. His work, Fumi Fugium, was republished a further four times in 1930, 1933, 1971 and 2011 in support of anti-pollution campaigning. Next slide, please. The first time Evelyn's work resurfaced in 1930, an anonymous reviewer in the magazine Nature is critical of the contemporary for the time smoke abatement propaganda involving the modern method of pictures showing the fall of smoke over our cities or the corrosion of stonework, comparing it unfavorably with Evelyn's use of robust literary language. This reads as though there was already fatigue over what was clearly a familiar issue. And this led me to consider what is the most effective way to communicate the peril in the air from air pollution. Next slide, please. Sarah is going to talk a bit about the rise of filmmaking from the Second World War onwards in the US. Similarly, in the UK and elsewhere, Films as propaganda for political and health related ends became the go to medium in the middle of the 20th century. Reflecting this trend in the archives at Welcome Collection of the organisation Environmental Protection UK, which started as the Coal Smoke Abatement Society in 1898, I found the typed shooting script for a campaigning film which was never made. The film only has a working title smoke abatement treatment dated 1947. 
I photographed the first and last pages of the script reproduced on this slide. The very first sequence opens with Fumi Fujian and a dramatization of Evelyn writing his treatise and reading from his work. The narrative was devised to disavow the idea that a cozy coal fire is ideal. The problem as perceived at the time was that people were resistant to change and valued their home comforts, even when they came with immediate disadvantages, such as drafts and dirt in the home caused by coal smoke. In the introductory note, it mentions that a fast moving survey type of film has been felt preferable to a slower, more detailed presentation. And a film designed to integrate a number of problems and to stimulate people to action must rely upon quick visual and oral contrasts. Therefore, the recommendation is that for maximum impact, the audience needed a pacey approach to the subject matter. Next slide. Here is some detail from the shooting script, which I've transcribed. This medium was chosen to enable the form suggested for the film to be adequately envisaged. In practice, there is a simultaneous commentary side by side with the visuals on the left and the commentary on the right. John Evelyn's voice, based on the words he published in 1661, weaves throughout the narrative and his words end the film. That men whose very being is air should not breathe it freely when they may, but condemn themselves to this misery is a strange stupidity. This is teamed with the final images of children looking up into the sun, perhaps to their future, which illustrates what they mean by visual and oral contrasts, and also reflects that film can achieve beyond other forms of media communication. Next slide. In reality, films were an expensive medium to produce. Many films were therefore sponsored by interested bodies. This may be government, pharmaceutical companies, religious bodies or other parties. The norm was to produce booklets and pamphlets and engage people on a more local basis. In the UK, smoke abatement propaganda was delivered to the public by health exhibitions, which were mounted in the UK at town halls and medical centres with displays and a plethora of pamphlets and leaflets. Photographs of this activity exist and some were published in the Medical Officer of Health reports which looked at health provision at a local level. Details of the activity in Leeds, the location specific to one of the films I'm going to talk about, are reproduced here with one taken at the Clean Air exhibition in 1959 and another from the Northern Ideal Homes exhibition 1962 with eager visitors peering at the displays, perhaps providing evidence that there was an appetite for environmental change, especially in light of the Great Smog of London in 1952, in which upwards of 12,000 people died, and then the subsequent Clean Air Act of 1956. In the centre, on the right, I've highlighted one book entitled Guilty Chimneys. This material proved invaluable to my research on one of the films I'm going to talk about and provided valuable context to the film alongside the written testimony of the filmmaker. Next slide. Generally, many of the AV materials which come to us are entirely atomized from their original context. Very few collections arrive with substantive paperwork. This means that histories of AV collections often need to be painstakingly reconstructed. Also, the historiography of films about the environment is rather thin. An entry on environmental films on Wikipedia mentions two well-documented films, The Plough That Broke the Plains and The River from the 1930s, which looked at the Dust Bowl years and the Great Depression and nothing before the 1960s. I suspect many of the films, such as the one Sarah and I talk about, are simply off the radar of most film scholars, at least until recently. Two films which arrived at Welcome with no context were made in the 1960s and address some of the issues which relate to air pollution and the existential threat it poses to our health in the future. The first film, It Takes Your Breath Away from 1964, from 1964 was made in Leeds, England, and then the other film from the USA, Horsepower and Hydrocarbons, 
from around 1967, looking at photochemical smog in Los Angeles. Both films were made by student filmmakers. It takes your breath away. I have written about in detail for medicine on screen. The film came to World Complexion from the British Medical Association's Film Archive when it was donated to the organization in 2005. The film had been submitted to the BMA's film competition and had won a medal. Dr. Mary Catterall, the scriptwriter and medical advisor to the film, was a respiratory consultant at Leeds General Infirmary at the time. She was shocked at the levels of respiratory distress she encountered in her clinic. In her self-published memoir, she mentioned how she became involved in the film. I met some filmmaking students who wanted a theme. I wanted some filmmakers to make a film. We collaborated. The companion film to It Takes Your Breath Away, Horsepower and Hydrocarbons, is a student film made at UCLA accredited to Thomas Stovern. Liaising with the archives at UCLA, we have yet to unearth any supporting material about the film's history. The first screen grab I have extracted from the film shows a woman with a newspaper with the headlines, Smog, Deadly as War, a powerful message which harks back to the historical association of smog with war in Peps and Co advertisement from 1913 seen earlier. From Welcome's perspective, this film entered the collection with two others on environmental themes. One made by a company, Shell, called Clean Air, and the other, Smog, the Silent Killer, from 1963, made in the US too. The latter film featured a British scientist, Dr. Patrick J. Lawther, when he headed the Air Pollution Research Laboratory at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London. Lawther had published on atmospheric pollution and lung cancer, the relationship between chronic bronchitis and air pollution, and children being the victims of environmental hazards. He had connections with environmental scientists in Washington, D.C., and is known to have attended a number of conferences there, so it may have been via this route that the films were added to the archives. Sometimes it's very hard to unpick the journeys films have made, although from these examples, film is a transnational medium. Next slide. Film is different to other media. It often incorporates a distinct rhetoric in the visual iconography used. Referencing the notes provided with the shooting script from 1947 I mentioned before, both these films use a survey methodology to build their case with repeated imagery. And it takes your breath away, the environmental culprit is chimney emissions. Unsurprisingly, there are city panoramas with these images and chimneys billowing smoke, those guilty chimneys. And in horsepower and hydrocarbons, it's the landscape dominated by roads and traffic and how our cities have become asphalt jungles antagonistic to humans. Next slide. And it takes your breath away, the impacts of pollution are seen on the built environment, especially to historic buildings, which was a hot topic at the time in the UK, with pollution leaving sooty deposits and then rain reacting with these particles and eroding the historic stonework. This contrasts with the domestic impact with constant cleaning required on surfaces and clothing. The script writer, Mary Catterall, mentioned in her memoir that prams placed outside for so-called fresh air were quickly made dirty with sooty deposits and perhaps more sinisterly, potentially impacting on the, those children's lungs. In horsepower and hydrocarbons, the drying laundry on the line would become quickly dirty due to photochemical smog. And even now I understand that drying laundry outside, according to a friend in Los Angeles, is not typical. This later film takes a more scientific approach in its evidence base, as well as these scenes in the laboratory on rats and a human subject. It also looks at the effect on plants. Next slide. Researching the background to It Takes Your Breath Away, Welcome was lucky to receive the paper archives of Mary Catterall in 2011. So as well as the scriptwriter, she was also its medical advisor. She was born Eileen Mary Williamson and her route into medicine was not straightforward. When she attended medical school in London in the 1940s, she was only one of seven women out of 77 medical students, indicative of the gender bias in the profession at the time. In 1959, she followed her husband to Leeds where he had secured a job at Leeds General Infirmary Immediately, she was struck by the levels of pollution there. 
in her words, I attack the urban pollution, particularly of Leeds, with my usual frontal assault. I talked graphically and frequently to doctors, city councillors, trade unions, to administrators, anyone who would listen, and to those who would have preferred not to. Reading now some of the articles I wrote and lectures I gave, I'm surprised that we had, we had as many friends as in fact we did. Outside London, the speed of change was very slow in enacting the recommendations of the Clean Air Act. Mary was a compassionate clinician who found herself on the front line of what looked like a medical emergency in Leeds. In particular, she wanted to highlight that hospitals being exempt from reducing their emissions were causing harm to their patients through the circulation of dirty air. In her autobiography, she speaks from a position of feeling marginalized in medicine because she was a woman, but this gave her freedom to speak for people who had no voice. Mary was also against the fatalism which prevailed in accepting the status quo. There is a phrase common in this region, where there's muck, there's grass, which means where there's pollution, there's profit, evidenced by the wealth and the shining brass buttons of factory owners, perhaps. The film was one small part in her campaigning activity. She was a lone campaigning female voice. The whole anti-pollution sector was dominated by men, as evidenced by this booklet published in celebration of the Clean Air Act in 1956, shown on the right, uh, which is entitled The Men Behind the Clean Air Act. Next slide. Health propaganda and campaigning films often use personal stories, whether fictional or real, to create emotional impact. In fact, the insertion of sequences of lived experience speaks to the practice of the medical case study, with examples of people presenting certain conditions to create a narrative understanding of health and disease. This adds credibility to the argument that air pollution is bad for health. Mary also appears in the scene I'm going to show you first from It Takes Your Breath Away, this sequence is sensitively shot but reveals the acute respiratory distress experienced with lung disease as well as its impact on well-being. It's very affecting. John Holmes, who appears in the film, is old before his years at 58. Care is taken to record the sounds of him struggling to breathe. Just to mention that Mr. Holmes has a very strong regional accent. The unnamed patient in hospital in horsepower and hydrocarbons directly addresses the audience and factually states his breathing difficulties, all made worse due to fluctuating levels in the quality of air. These examples are both white males and one of the reasons for this is arguably that on a population level a higher incidence of occupational exposure and smoking during their employment. Um, Next slide, please. And um, this will be the two clips and they'll play back to back. Often from the hospital's own chimney. In this hospital, the cost of cleaning far exceeds the cost of drugs. Many bronchitics sit at home too breathless to work. How long have you been out of work? Six years. Do you sit like this all day? Yes. Why do you sit like it's that? It's only where it happens very, very. Do you have any pain? Yes. I've got some pain in my elbows, usually one of them. Are they sore? Very sore. Do the days seem very long to you? Oh, the day isn't bad. It's long. Night's what's long. How long do you usually sleep? Around about three hours. What wakes you up? Well, I couldn't tell you what wakes me up, but I wake me up short of breath. I can't breathe. I get up. Can you lie flat? No, can't lie flat. Did you have a good night last night? No. 
And then what happened after an hour? Well, I get it upset here a bit and I have to try to get back again. Another hour. Sometimes I do an hour, sometimes I do less. It all depends on my breathing. And you sit up here in the night as well as the day? Yes, oh yes. yes. In the overcrowded conditions of small houses, young children breathe in the germs that are coughed over them. When plants are sad on the cold winter's evening, when the snow was falling gently from the sky, a lovely baby dog was a little girl asked his wife and his kids had and food. Many authorities regard clean air as a luxury to be enjoyed at some time when it's more convenient. We cannot postpone our next breath until it's more convenient. And in the meantime, the air we breathe is dirty and dangerous. Bronchitis and other lung diseases cripple and kill. <coughs> People need clean air. Often from the hospital's own chimney. Fields are guilty. New and used. Common and unique. Gulping in precious air, polluting what's left. Even while turned off, the automobile soils the air. Simple evaporation accounts for 10% of our problem. Running, idling, or off. Always consuming, always polluting. Clothes that may never be clean because of smog and the victims of lung diseases, made worse by smog. Having had a chronic obstructive lung disease as well, or in other words, emphysema, during heavy smoke concentrations, I get a very heavy pressure on my chest. Of course, it's very hard for me to breathe in the Los Angeles area because when you get in a traffic jam, it is far from pleasant with all the pollution in the air. And I look forward to the days that we will be without smog. Fields are guilty. These are the final words from the commentary for horsepower and hydrocarbons. Clean air is our heritage, now our responsibility. We must actively support and share in air pollution control. It's as important as our next breath. This closing sequence um, is reminiscent of the one I identified in the unmade film from 1947, with children looking up at the sky, though it appeals to our better sense rather than suggesting that the audience is stupid. With the two films I've told you about, I've endeavoured to reveal what kind of thought and research goes into unpicking their hidden histories. This is one approach to looking at films through a historical lens. Next, Sarah is going to talk about an amazing cohort of films which have an enviable distribution record as discovered in Sarah's research. Sarah. Next slide. Thank you. This pamphlet is a wonderful place to begin talking about the US government's use of moving images to rally the citizenry and combat pollution. Free Films on Air Pollution is a pamphlet that can be found in NLM Digital Collections, also at the National Archives. And it demonstrates just how active the government was in producing or sponsoring films throughout the 1960s and early 70s. This was the period during which the Clean Air Act was passed Clean water legislation was strengthened, 
and the Environmental Protection Agency was created during the Nixon administration in 1970. And it was not just the executive branch in the form of the Public Health Service and other agencies, but also the US Senate that enthusiastically embraced this charge and this medium. We haven't processed or collected all of the films featured in this pamphlet, but we will. The thing to notice, uh, again, is the breadth of participants. American networks such as CBS, NBC, PBS, their local affiliates, some polluting industries who probably have their own reasons um, for participating. And this was likely along the lines of, um, yes, it's a problem, we need to do something about it, but this is the price we pay for our prosperity and a high standard of living. And there are other films that would take issue with that perspective, of course. Narrators of these films were respected journalists such as Daniel Shore and Sander Van Oker and actors such as Hume Cronin. And this suggests a, a collective belief that this was a critical topic worthy of reasonably high production values and efforts to disseminate. Next slide. The Senate Committee on Public Works made two films, one on air pollution, one on water pollution. Members of the committee appeared in uh, the films, diligently working away, marking up their legislation, Democrats and Republicans. And while we don't yet hold a copy of Ill Winds on a Sunny Day, we do have a poster in the NLM Prints and Photographs collection, which you see here on the right, that shows that the film was screened on the NIH campus in a few different locations. Ill Winds was narrated by actor James Garner, and the other film on water pollution was narrated by Henry Fonda. And of course, the image on the lower left is James Garner Rockford, not James Garner, anti-pollution guy. Next slide. So why film? Because moving images were thought to be an effective medium for holding a person's attention, for stimulating discussion, and encouraging civic participation. It's the post-World War II era. The military has led the way during the war in the production and use of film to educate, illustrate, and warn. And most films were aimed directly at soldiers, uh, addressing venereal disease, uh, malaria, combat fatigue. But also these films were made um, aimed at the public and to disseminate information the government wanted the public to know. From there into that post-war period, educational, instructional, and persuasive film took off. When films were shown in a community, a moderated discussion following the film was considered a key element of translating that viewpoint or that viewing experience into individual or community actions. So it needed to be a structured discussion is the thinking. Next slide. I'm going to show you a couple of clips here. This first is just the intro to a film from the late 1960s. I believe it was first made in 67, and we have a version from 69. It emphasizes both personal responsibility and coming together as a community. Oh, and here's the arch again, the same thing you saw before in the exhibit. Sure, I hear a lot about it, but I just don't have time to worry about it. This image of a young girl also appears in Ill Winds. Oh, if we live in the city, you bet we'd be concerned about it. But it doesn't bother us much out here. Look, there are plenty of people around who know a lot more about this than I do. Let the experts take care of it. Quite a number of these dramatic hospital images. More important images. to you than the air you breathe. 
Keeping it pure and clean is too important to leave to anyone but yourself. By the time we get to the 19, early 1970s, the vibe has shifted. Pause it, please. So the clip that you're about to see is from Countdown to Collision. In the 1960s, there was more of a presenting the problem and figuring out how to respond feel especially if it was made, if the film was made directly by the government. By the 1970s, it's turning to apocalyptic critiques of consumerism and waste, and this is well covered by Dr. Peterson in her Medicine on Screen essay. So the tone has really shifted, and the maker of Countdown to Collision, Murdoch Head of Airly Productions, had kind of a groovy way of doing things. Early Productions was based at the Airly Center out in Virginia. It was founded in 1961, and it was referred to as a progressive island of thought um, at that time throughout the 1960s and 70s. And Murdoch had made a lot of films about the environment, about global health and overpopulation, and about drug use. Many of them supported, um, at least in part, by the government. He also spent a few years in prison, something related to bribery, but when he got out, he went right back to making movies. So now you're going to see a clip from Countdown to Collision. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard 20th Century Airlines Flight 1980. We'll be fleeing almost indefinitely. They seem to have us in a holding pattern of some sort around the sun, I think. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it may be necessary to move some of you folks in first class back into the economy section. We may not have enough dinners aboard or enough wine, because um, we have plenty of snacks. We'd just like to request that you keep your trash in and around your own seat. Otherwise, we seem to be in good shape. We have enough air for years of this sort of cruising. You uh, may think it smells a little funny, but then 
surface of water. However, you can reuse all the water you want. You just pump it right back up there. Get it again. Now, in the unlikely event, there should be a temporary failure in the cabin air and water supply. A compartment over your head will open automatically, and a rubber Halloween face mask will drop down. Just pull it over your head and, and use one another as best you can. So you see how visual and oral this is. In fact, there's a 10 minute montage, musical montage in the middle of this film. Uh, no narration, just image and music, time lapse, which again, Dr. Peterson explores in her essay. And recall that this film was made in 1973, just a few years after the moon landing and after the first Earth Day. So space is on our minds, the planet is on our minds. And the end of this segment leaves one with um, almost grotesque imagery, uh, not of trash, but rather of people. Rubber Halloween masks, you imagine ghouls and zombies circling the sun indefinitely. So it's otherworldly and, and, and catastrophic. That's the kind of existence that, that that's what may await us. Um, next slide. So I was very interested in how these films were distributed and deployed um, in the country. And in researching a newspaper database that I found, uh, I was able to confirm that Countdown was seen in a number of settings. Besides community screenings with organized discussions to follow, it was uh, it and other films were also aired on television, a medium that the American public was fully embracing in the 1960s and 1970s. It had a broad reach. Uh, at that time, there were four major networks, and they didn't run programming 24 hours a day, so you watched what was on. And uh, in my review of newspaper uh, databases, I found just many instances of Countdown and other programs. Uh, next slide, I'll show you a little bit more of those. Next slide, please. So here are some other examples of pollution films being broadcast and shown in community settings. So there's um, you know, a film festival at a community college. There's a tea. There's a pollution uh, control committee meeting. And then in St. Louis, this business of air, which was filmed in St. Louis and East St. Louis, is shown on a, a Saturday night at 7 p.m. Now, measuring what type of impact the films may have had is much harder to do. And Angela talked about some of the challenges of, of, of tracing things when it comes to film. And this is kind of just another dimension to it. Did, did the people who watched or attended a community meeting, did they, did they modify their behaviors? Did they become activists? It's, it's a research topic of its own and um, a question that it would be very interesting to explore. Next slide. Still today, when educating ourselves about perils in the air, what's one thing you can do according to the American Lung Association? Well, you can encourage everyone to host virtual film screenings. The film that they mention here, Unbreathable, The Fight for Healthy Air, next slide. You'll get a sense for what that looks like. And this is just a screen grab. It looks like you can play the video, but it's just a capture. If you go to the Unbreathable uh, website, you can view about a two and a half minute Vimeo about the movie. And again, it would be interesting to know if um, some of these actual virtual, these virtual screenings were held. And I think they were clearly intended to be part of a broader discussion, just as back in the uh, post-war era films were framed as a way of motivating and organizing people. Next slide. As a coda, I wanted to mention this too. During a longish telework day last month, um, I dashed over to my local coffee bar. And while I was waiting, I, my eyes fell upon this April 2021 issue of National Geographic, in which the, practically the whole issue is devoted to the fight for clean air. So I start, I start flipping through it, taking substandard pictures with my phone, and it's COVID-focused, but when you think about what we've been discussing here, this same topic could have been a National Geographic issue 50 or 55 years ago. Now, this is COVID-focused, but it's kind of layered on top of existing disparities between um, wealthy countries and poorer countries in terms of kind of air they breathe. Next slide, please. 
and finishing up here, looking pretty closely at pollution's toll on the body, what that means for different systems, and again, layering COVID on top of it, you can imagine that it's, um, it is still seen as a very serious threat to world health. So at this point, uh, we'll wrap up. Thank you very much, everyone. And we will move into a question and answer moderated by Dr. Jeff Resnick. Thank you both very much. Uh, great presentations. And uh, we have uh, several questions that um, I'm receiving through the live feedback button below the video cast. So if uh, any of you watching do, if you have a question, just use the live feedback button. Or if you're on uh, Twitter, you can uh, direct message me at Jeffrey S. Resnick or um, use the uh, hashtag NLN his talk. So the, the first question we have, um, it's interesting to note this person writes the specificity with which some early films, even going back to Evelyn's 17th century book addresses environmental issues, chimneys and cars in particular. Later environmental activist films like Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth took a relatively broader approach. Why do you think the message changed is it because the earlier films were actually effective, so the problems they highlighted had already been mitigated? Angela, you want to take that one? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think one of the things I, I noticed was a sense of fatigue, so I'm not entirely sure whether those early films were um, successful, um, but clearly, um, the repeated imaging works within the kind of the framework of a single film, maybe a small kind of cohort of films, but it doesn't seem to persist over time. And that may well be kind of that sense of fatigue um, and the kind of you know, the desire for novelty is, is perhaps something that's kind of, you know, that's part of being human perhaps. Um, how about you, Sarah, What's from, what, from your perspective, what, what do you think? Well, I think, yes, fatigue comes to mind. And at least in the films that I was you know, able to pull from our collection and that were discussed in Medicine on Screen, there aren't, there aren't a lot of solutions offered. And there's a lot of description of the problem. There's dramatic imagery. But there aren't, and, and there's, you know, get out there and, and do something. But what to do is not really addressed very well. And I think that is one thing that improved. I mean, even starting with, or, you know, with with the with Earth Day and the communications around that, you know, we can stop throwing trash on the ground. We can. There were some very specific things that I think evolved, and so I do think I do think the the message got a little bit more robust. Um, and as I think we began to understand climate change, which you know also is not just a you know post two thousand thing, but was was recognized earlier. I think I think more contributors to the to the environmental you know, environmental threats were kind of uh, classified as such and talked about i also think there's something about layering when it comes to community you know media communications particularly in the health sector uh, both of us have kind of found evidence of um kind of how some of the issues were framed in the in an exhibition kind of the, those kind of health exhibitions which are, are really important um in public health the public health sector um and then the book the booklets and the pamphlets and the other kind of collateral that's all kind of comes comes with it so in many ways the films are kind of either the cherry on the top or they're just kind of part of the part of the you know like the armory you know of uh, of kind of you know health propaganda and it's very interesting that we, you know we think of um, we might think of propaganda now in a very pejorative sense um, because we might think of, you know, the kind of Second World War and think about its use in political ends. But propaganda was kind of considered, um, health propaganda was, was kind of a thing. It was really kind of quite, um, quite earnestly uh, looked at and um, messaging was really, um, you know, really, you know, um, people took this very seriously about what messages and the means of delivering them as well so they could kind of thought very carefully about the audiences but i think it's so interesting that you have that access sarah to um that distribution record that is just really um unbelievable and one of the films 
I, I spoke about the one from Leeds, I managed to find evidence of one screening from in 1966, which is probably several years after the film was made. Just, I mean, that's just one. And I just thought, and I, I had to spend a lot of time looking. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure it probably, I, th I think it's probably just a small snapshot of, of, of the, you know, the, the, really the breadth and the reach that some of these films had. But again, it's, it's hard to know the impact. So uh, that's a, a great lead into the next set of questions that, that I received. Um, and I'm going to kind of combine these uh, together. So can you speak about how the producers of any one or more of these films themselves thought about impact? How did they, how did they hope to measure uh, impact? Did they go so far as to survey their audience? And then the related question is, uh, several people have written, you know, can you say more about how any community received a particular film? Was there, can you track the, any debate about the film that went on in a public setting? Individuals who disagreed with what was being portrayed or individuals who said, oh, we ought to take action as a result of what we've seen. Uh, well, one thing I said to Angela um, as we were putting this together was, you know, I've I've found all these mentions in a newspaper database, and now what I want to find is a letter to the editor that is in this database that says, I was, you know, so glad to see your report on the local water, you know, water and sewer board, um, and that, you know, they're taking pollution seriously and encouraging action of this, this, or that. I wanted to find something that said somebody read this and responded. But I, I wasn't finding that material. I do think that, uh, I, I know that films that were made by the, if the National Medical Audiovisual Center, which was affiliated with the, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and then, uh, then moved up here to Bethesda, and was always part of, part of sort of the library's um, sphere. I do know that they tracked, you know, numbers of, films, they loaned films, they produced films, they also acquired films, and then they loaned them out, they circulated them. And there are some, some figures on, general figures on circulation, but not really specific to title. You know, we sent out this many thousands of films. And so, no, I have not been able to find, I have not been able to get down in the weeds and find, you know, what sort of debate was engendered. There was one newspaper clip that I didn't end up putting in, but it it was kind of interesting because it was a it was a ladies auxiliary. A lot of these things were gendered like this. They were ladies groups, teas or auxiliaries or um, knitting circles, and they would show they would they would also have a broader kind of social agenda and would show these films. Uh, so in one of them, uh, the the woman who was leading the talk actually it says lifted up a trash can and spread the trash all over the room and said, you know, we don't need to go down to the landfill to see trash. It you know it's all around us. And I imagine that somebody like that probably didn't, you know, stop there. She probably took it further, and she probably organized some kind of action. But, but I, I, we we don't, you know, we have don't have that research at this point. Thank you. And the only the only way I can sort of speak to that question a little bit is that um, certainly Mary Catterall, in her memoir, mm -hmm. um, takes some credit, or she kind of. Uh, asserts that she she's she can take some credit for making Leeds into the sparkling city it is now and it's a really great city if you ever get to visit um, and I unpicked that a little bit in my essay on medicine on screen because actually I think she was swimming with the tide um, and that's one of the things I think Sarah sort of addressed a bit more in her um, in her kind of presentation because you know we have you know the kind of moon landings we have space we have Earth Day and things kind of society is shifting and changing. And it's not that kind of, you know, it's not, I don't think we can really correlate that kind of, you know, exactly, but we know more or less things seem to be kind of, you know, changing in that kind of direction. And that civic responsibility seems to be um, kind of more, I don't know, more, more in evidence, I think, from perhaps the, you know, the rise of television, for example, rather than the films that I was showing would be, they were distributed on film. So there was had to be an expectation that there was a projector there 
and then you have the kind of it's quite onerous so it'd have to be posted and then they would have to be posted back and then checked and that kind of thing so um you know but if you put it on television it's kind of your you, you you're quite passive in terms of receiving it so Sarah that you're right you know the kind of some of the tv stuff might be difficult to evaluate in terms of impact although the numbers are there right but then I think the T the groups are really interesting and how great it would be to be in a kind of a time machine and go back and kind of witness exactly what happened you know yes thank you so so with regard to uh television and the rise of television um someone wrote in and asked uh to, uh, with regard to James Garner, this is, a this is a question for you, Sarah. Did do you know if James Garner was paid for his involvement in the film that you you mentioned, or did he do it uh, as a public service? Assuming likely that he did it as the latter. But can you say I, more about his participation? And then, you know, famous individuals generally, both actors and uh, voiceover uh, uh, specialists. Yeah, the the. While the pamphlet "Free Films on Air Pollution" does talk about the number, the, the the participants and the you know the kind of high profile participants, it doesn't speak to whether or not they were paid. Um, that's a really interesting question. I mean, these films there was there was money for them. I mean, the the Senate Committee on Public Works was you know gung ho to make at least these two films. They may have made more, but these are the pollution ones that they made. They had a budget. I suspect they were probably capable of paying something. I don't, you know, I don't know if if you've got journalists, you've got actors. I don't know even if there would have been um, sort of a, div a divide between, you know, the the um, level of of uh, I don't know interest and knowledge about the particular topic. But one assumes that the, those who agreed to participate thought it was a worthy a worthy topic. But I don't. I guess I don't know the answer to whether or not they were. Paid. I don't think everybody. I mean, I think I think these definitely cost some money to produce, and so um, you know they may well have been. Thank you. Uh, we've had several questions about um, health disparities in cities, both in the UK and and the United States. Um, a question for you, Angela. Uh, to, to what extent did I'm trying to kind of explain this one question we received. To what extent did the did the central funding of these films by the UK government, in, in instances that that you can uh, identify, did they did this funding spur the funding of these productions at a regional or local level? Um, Was that a dynamic at play in the UK? Mm, not no not 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 that I maybe my gaze hasn't been in that direction um yeah. I mean certainly I can think um that these are you know these are student films so there is uh a, a, like a heightened sense of injustice in them so I mean I've kind of very very much privileged um in one film Mary Cattle's view um because she's kind of in the medical profession so I think she felt responsible but the students have um they yeah my, my feeling is the students that they're, they're delivering a product so there's a little bit of um um they are a little bit formulaic formulaic in certain respects in terms of their survey but they do they're very clear on identifying those disparities um i mean the kind of documentary movement really did start with looking at kind of like l how lives were really lived um and I can think about films on, you know, things like slums um, and housing, um, which is kind of tied up with, you know, pollution and, and various other kind of like how we live in cities. Um, these films aren't really part of that. Um, I mean, I haven't thought about them as part of that continuum, but clearly as a as kind of a, as a documentary style, they are referencing their kind of uh, their forebears to a to a certain degree. I mean, certainly, you know, like the health disparities are in the longer film. Um, I had a kind of interesting discussion with um, Sarah about class because it does make us, it does make a, um, um, this kind of correlation between um, the, you know, class and where people live, what professions they have, where they live, where they choose to live, where they have to live. 
and certainly in her um in Mary's uh, memoirs she's she's kind of she writes quite a bit about kind of her, her experiences um other than that I'm not sure um yeah I'm I, I it's interesting I, I kind of that gives me some inspiration to look a bit closer and see if I can find some things I can you know I can tie into that thank you thank you oh, I just wanted to say um I'm reminded Angela that when I first watched it takes your breath away all the way through they they very um you know clearly refer to where uh people of social class one tend to live social class four or five tend to live and the different conditions um and it is it is about disparity but i remember saying to angela are they really saying that social class one they're actually labeling people class one or class two or class three and saying that in the film and to me that sounded Gosh, that's kind of offensive, but and I think Angela, you were um, explaining that at least in that era and maybe still today, that that's just a very common way of way we might say working class or middle class in the U.S. and in the U.K. It would be more common to have you know attaching so social class one, two, three, and then you understood what's meant by that. So anyway, I just uh, yeah kind of yeah no, I, you're thinking you're right. I mean about population analysis at the time. And yeah. perhaps I didn't make it very clear, but that neither of these films were necessarily made for that their audiences were a little bit more defined and that it takes your breath away was made for medical audiences. Um, it didn't have a kind of public airing as such. Um, and then the, the horsepower to hydrocarbons, I'm not, I'm not so sure, actually. I mean, it does have quite a lot of um more medical and technical content but uh, you know i'm really keen if anybody has encountered that film before or knows any of the context if you watch the if you've got time go and watch the full film and maybe that will um you know that will kind of unearth some more scholarship that's kind of waiting to be revealed and maybe you could uh, remind uh, individuals who are watching where they could go see these films both of you Oh, well, the the films that we present clips from can all be found in NLM digital collections and the two that, well, I guess, Angela, yeah, the two that you talked about can, can be found on the Welcome Collection website as well, correct? As well, yeah, but yeah. they're also within the, you know, the NLM audiovisual section as yeah. well. Yeah, in fact, we got our, our copy copy of Horsepower and uh, our copies of both of those came from Angela. So Horsepower and Hydrocarbons is a uh, a film made in the U.S. I think by UCLA students. Angela. Yeah, that's right. right? But yeah. I had not heard of it, so it's thanks to Angela that we do have a copy of it in NLM Digital Collections. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, another question uh, that's that's come to us. Uh, Sarah mentioned uh, some polluting industries participating in these film projects. Could you possibly be more specific about how they navigated these anti-pollution campaigns? Well, going back to the Darkening Day exhibit in 1970 and the images that I have seen from that exhibit, uh, the uh, NLM exhibitions program did share an envelope, a, a folder of scans. It, it just, uh, it was surprisingly uncontroversial and it seemed, now you don't know the creator of this exhibit. We don't know how many uh, industrial giants he may have approached who said, I don't want to be part of an anti-pollution exhibit, but um, there's lots of correspondence between the curator of the exhibit and different companies and different nonprofits. And I think um, as a rule, they saw it as an opportunity the same way, you know, we, we see maybe some of our, <laughs> our big tech companies today trying to position themselves on you know, the, the right side of history in certain ways. Um, people are caring about this more. We, DuPont, for example, if you go back to these, we don't need to go back to it, but on the slide that I showed with, um, uh, that had images from the uh, 1970 exhibit, you see there's a DuPont model for some kind of, I don't know, I know they weren't a car company, obviously, but it seemed to be some kind of clean carburetor thing. And so I think they were, they were interested in positioning themselves as, you know, being in the business of doing what they do, 
but there are also some good outputs from this and they recognize too that um you know there's there, there there's a role to be played by car companies and others and of course you you know they all want to get out a little bit in front and say that they're doing something or doing something before they get regulated into doing it. Yeah, just kind of very anecdotally, um, we've had films in the collection that are that are kind of sponsored by pharmaceutical companies, for instance. And my understanding is that some large organizations have community funds and they would use some of that community community funding to make films sometimes. And the films would sometimes sit a little bit outside the main strategy. Of the organizations the only the only the organization i mean i mentioned that because that seems to fit with trying with some things but on the other hand there are other organizations i'm thinking about shell in particular that had an amazing film unit with kind of you know they're kind of incredibly high production values really experienced team made absolutely stunning films um so it's kind of it is quite interesting um about where these individual organizations how they situated this particular activity. Um. Very good, thank you. Uh, so someone has written in uh, with thanks to both of you for these presentations. What are your next steps in the work that you both do in terms of collecting and preserving these films and writing about them? What, what are your next projects? Well, I'll, I'll say that I know for sure my next project or related to this specifically, I've already been in touch with the National Archives, which because of COVID is not able to um, offer the same kinds of services that they would in non-COVID times, but they hold a number of these uh, free films on air pollution that we don't yet hold. So I am going to get copies of those as soon as I can from the National Archives and add that to our archive and you know, maybe do uh, eventually we might have a follow on sort of a third installment for medicine on screen where we add some of these films to the to the, you know, the set that we highlight and that have been highlighted in a, you know, a number of different um, a number of different forums. And the other thing that I, I feel is a related piece to all this, I mentioned that Murdoch head of early productions has made a lot of films on global health and population. And we are in the process of having digitized now about, about 200 new titles on those topics, many of which were made by Airly Productions and which we have had um, in our unprocessed offsite cold vault for probably 20 years. And we are now able to digitize those and we're going to get those up onto uh, digital collections and already have a couple of people lined up to write about them for medicine on screen. So, and they are very much, you know, couched as part of its you know, response to, you know, environmental cat catastrophe, like overpopulation contributes to this as well. And a lot of those were supported by the uh, U.S. Um, Agency for International Development, as well as a couple of other federal agencies. So it kind of comes full circle to this federal support that's a really interesting set of, of, of films in that I, I can say for sure that this kind of support would not be offered by the by the government to films on this topic, um, on the topic of overpopulation and, and, you know, and different ways to respond to it. So those are some of my next steps. Right, and you, Angela? Yeah, I mean, on a personal level, I'm very interested in, I mentioned uh, Patrick Lawther, and um, I'm, I'm interested in the kind of the this kind of the whole genre of films where I kind of call the medical films a hidden cinema. And um, that kind of the idea of kind of the, the influence of the scientist um, as a medical or scientific advisor, which is kind of quite a shadowy and quite kind of some in a very um, hard, hard to define and also hard to, you know, a little bit hard to research. There's a couple of things that come to mind in the in the collection, not necessarily to do with air pollution, but I'm very interested in that, that intersection between, you know, science and, and, and films. But on, a, and on an institutional level, we are um, looking at um, mounting uh, an exhibition for the public next um, year in sort of April, May, which will take the theme of um, air. So, um, that will be quite interesting um, and I've already been um, 
doing a bit more research into the archives and sharing some of the research that I've um, I've been doing with Sarah and I shared today with the curators just to kind of say, well, here's here's some of the interesting things that I found. And there's a lot of really quite kind of, um, um, if you like, I mean, archives can be extraordinary, um, but there's kind of, there's what could be quite a lot of ant-like toil when it comes to looking at lots of papers and minutes and things and then it's you kind of just feel like you're dozing off and then oh no here it is this is exactly what i'm looking for so that's that's so that's kind of you know the, the joy of discovery so um i don't think i'm going to stop doing that um but yes i mean i i wonder it might well come full circle but sarah you kind of really you know i just oh we have population films coming out of our ears that's another area that we can look at. Um, yeah we can do a lot with that yeah which takes us kind of a bit later maybe into you know it's the 80s and yes 1980s exactly as well, yeah which 70s kind of, and 80s yeah yeah mm -hmm. so i mean it's also quite interesting the way these themes kind of they come into focus and then they kind of you know they ebb away a little bit and that might be to do the with the way you know, films are kind of they they're lost and they're found, or they can be um, you know they kind of become as you know separated from their kind of their fellow films. As Sarah, you said, you know, you've got the you're missing the one that you really want, and you yeah. have to kind of hang on a little bit longer. I mean, we used to we used to kind of like being disappointed and then hanging you know hanging on there a bit longer. Yeah. Well, thank you both very, very much for your presentations. And, and I'm sure that many viewers uh, today are, are inspired to learn more uh, from both of you and the collections you oversee. I, I certainly am and very grateful for, for the time you, you took to put these presentations together and to really surface the synergy between the collections uh, as well as your, your expertise. And um, so we'll leave it there. And uh, your contact details are very kindly on this slide. So we encourage people to be in touch and we thank everyone for tuning in today. And uh, this presentation, the co-presentation, will be available in the archive of History of Medicine events uh, here at NIH, uh, freely available to all, as this talk has been. Uh, so thank you again, Sarah and Angela. Best to both of you, and appreciate your time very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, thank you. and thank you, everybody.